Okay, it's hi, it's uh, Paul Beckwith. Um, I'm uh, with the University of Ottawa, the uh, Laboratory for Paleoclimatology. And uh, last video, I talked about um, buoyant nutrient flakes, which could possibly be used to um, get the oceans teeming with life again. Um, these buoyant flakes would be designed to float around in the ocean for 6 to 12 months and they would have all the essential nutrients that would be required uh, that, that are limiting phytoplankton growth, especially in the southern oceans. Um, so rather than have uh, boom and bust uh, blooms of phytoplankton um, and then they die and the organic matter sinks to the bottom causing dead zones, these nutrients would be released slowly at the ocean surface. They would get the phytoplankton growing at a sustainable pace, and then, then the zooplankton would follow small fish all the way up the food chain. And um, these things could be mass produced, these buoyant uh, flakes could be mass produced. And uh, I also uh, was, the, the key point is that there were times, well, just about 400 years ago in the previous, um, the ocean was teeming with life. Um, I'm uh, having mechanical problems here. There we go. Back on track. You don't want to go too fast. Okay, uh, this is what, what you get. You get what you pay for, eh? So I just jury rigged this system up so I could be close to the camera and, and um, what I said could be heard over the sound of the motor. So we'll keep going. Um, so, yeah, the, the, uh, for about 400 years ago, uh, the biomass on the planet was two to six times higher. In fact, uh, you know, even a hundred or so years ago, people used to say that they could almost walk on the ocean because there were so much, it, it was so full of life. Uh, so think of all the bio, think of all the carbon that would be stored if we were able to uh, restore that back again. Um, also, we would make the um, Earth system uh, much more resilient to shocks. Um, so, so that was sort of a good news uh, idea on carbon dioxide uh, removal from the, from the atmosphere and from the oceans. So lessening uh, greenhouse gas effect, lessening um, ocean acidification. Uh, today I'm going to talk about one of the big downsides of, uh, of abrupt climate change and uh, specifically heat waves. So uh, droughts are getting a lot worse um, under climate change because not only do we have extended longer periods uh, where we have these stuck jet streams, so we get these ridges and we get these um, extremely warm um, regions but also no rainfall in those regions. So that combination dries out the soils and leads to these long-term droughts like what we're seeing in um, California. But what we're also seeing is uh, what we're also seeing is we're gonna we're reaching um, mechanical problem. There we go. We're reaching um, a situation where um, it's just there's too much moisture in the air and it's too hot. So uh, what the wet bulb temperature is is. If you take a thermometer, uh, mercury thermometer, and measure the direct temperature of the air, um, okay, that's that's what that's what we know as temperature. Um, now, if you actually get a moist um, rag on the end of the thermometer, and then you swing the thermometer around, um, such that there's airflow through the moisture, it causes that moisture to evaporate. And uh, that will cool, that takes up energy, so it cools the thermometer. So the wet bulb temperature is always below the dry temperature, if you like, or the normal temperature, as long as the humidity is not 100%, because when you sling it along, you need that evaporation to depress the uh, wet bulb temperature. If you've got 100% humidity in the air and you sling it along, you know, you sling this wet bulb thermometer around, then the temperature won't be depressed because there'll be no longer evaporation. So at that point, the wet bulb and the normal temperature are equal, um, and there's 100% humidity of air. Now, why is this significant, and why is the 
the number 35 degrees Celsius significant? Well, the number is significant because at 35 degrees Celsius, when the wet bulb temperature is 35 degrees Celsius, then the body, the human body, is no longer to is no longer able to um, to cool itself down. It's no longer able to lose heat to the to the air around at 35 degrees C wet bulb. So therefore, core temperature rises, and if that situation um, is maintained for any reasonable length of time, then the body system starts shutting down and the person will die. A person out, outdoors um, basically cannot survive with a wet bulb temperature of 35 degrees Celsius or higher. So why is this significant? This is also significant because there's large parts of the world now where the ocean temperatures near the equator, um, say in regions of India or even perhaps along the coastlines of the Middle East, um, where the ocean temperatures are 33 degrees Celsius. So they're putting up a lot of water vapor. So the wet bulb temperature right near those regions will be 33 degrees Celsius. So it's just a couple degrees lower. So uh, a couple more degrees and we'll ha you won't be able to basically, the human won't be able to live outside in those areas. So large parts of the planet near the equator will be actually become uninhabitable to humans. Um, and then as the temperatures, as these zones increase in uh, duration, how long uh, that situation occurs, and uh, area, then this will become extremely serious for us. So we're actually going to be, we're actually approaching this. So uh, there will be, with unchecked, abrupt climate change mayhem that is occurring, uh, we will, uh, uh, we will reach a situation where, where large parts of the, um, large zones of the planet. They'll start off small and then they'll expand. will be basically uh, uh, no man's land or sorry, no no person's land um, to people um, basically being outside unless they're, they're specially equipped or something um, with cooling suits or something. So uh, uh, this is a very important point and it's often not stressed people aren't aware of it so I wanted to do a separate video on it so thank you for your attention